Hello everybody and be welcome to Terraxiles, a new show on YouTube that I'll make. The topic of this video will be Terra, is it worth it? Or is it still worth it? You can skip this, but let me put in a little introduction here. Some of you may still know me, I did a Skyrim mod series on YouTube, so I will take care of that the videos will be as short and informative as possible. I plan to do especially videos for new players since I saw that there are quite some people joining in the last months who don't know much about the game. Also videos about what's new in the Korean version of Terra and dungeon and class guides. Maybe some fun stuff too. I stopped the Skyrim mod series because I don't have the time for that anymore, but I like Terra, I want new players to join the game and enjoy it, so I thought I will make this kind of videos, since I have a full time job now, which wasn't the case when I did the Skyrim videos, so my time is rather limited. I'm playing currently on Europe, Kilian is the server, my main is Ziodin and I have almost all classes on level 60 with an eye level of 160 to 170. Side of my sock, the sorcerer is still level 49 but I'm planning to get this guy to 60 soon too. I started at the beta or the head launch with the collector's edition, knew the game for quite some time, played it on the Gamescom in Germany, then when it actually started I dropped it after about a month and I was quite busy at that time. Then I tried the Korean version for a couple of weeks when it still was, uh, yeah, a pay to play. And since the game went free to play in Europe, I came back and since then I'm over a year now, I'm still playing the game. So, let us get to the actual video. Before I jump into any details, let's get the main question out of the way. Is Terra still worth playing? And the answer for new players who don't know the game is yes, definitely. For returning players who know the game mechanics already, I would say partly, because there may be some things that haven't changed by now, which you have been disappointed by. Now let's get to the meat of the game. I split it this into a couple of categories and I will go through all of them. This will be the core information that you want to hear to decide for yourself if the game is worth it or not for your personal preferences. One of the main topics of Terra have always been the graphics. A couple years ago when the game released it was just fantastic, mind blowing, it looked so great. But what about now? Well, the game still looks great, it still looks good. Of course, there are games coming along, new stuff which has better graphics, but at just how things go over time, naturally. One graphic aspect in Terra that is really superior are the animations. They look fantastic, they are so smooth, they look powerful, they just chain into another. I've hardly seen any other game with such good animations, especially in the MMO section. And somehow Terra reminds me always of Darksiders, if you happen to know that game. Terra has a lot of variations regarding its different looking armors and weapons. Very detailed, like very, very little details on those armors and weapons. Reminds me a little bit of the Skyrim modding community. And the zones are very, very beautiful. There are forests, jungles, deserts or beaches, you have wide fields or weird magical places, snowy, icy, rocky volcanic landscapes or the organified zones and even more. Let's talk about the gameplay while we're leaving out the combat system. So there are 8 races and 8 classes. You can play each combination that you want, it's completely free to choose for you. Also soon there will be another class with a chain sickle, the so called reaper with no official name yet in Europe. But this class will be restricted to Ellen only so far and there's no information if it will open up or eventually for any other race. Unfortunately, Terra struggles a lot with its gameplay features. For example, things are outdated, like what kind of options you have for your guild, or how the pets work, or completely missing, like the housing that was actually... It, had, it should have been in the game from the beginning, but it got delayed and delayed and eventually nobody talked about it again anymore. 
and things are also getting a rework right now like the crafting but of course it's not stated or you don't know if it's gonna be any good or not so far it looks at least better what the Koreans are getting and they are just in the process of updating that. Trading in Terra works mostly via trade broker of course you can trade from person to person as well and there's an achievement system which rewards you with titles, mounts, pets, items and little stat bo boosts and this is important for new players because that's a way to get a very nice mount very early in the game. Important for new players is that the first instance opens up at level 20, this will be when you're able to use the instance matching tool, and at level 30 you will be able to queue to your first battleground. Also newly implemented is the Ancient Relic system, which will basically help new players level faster by letting mobs of your level drop certain items that you will use to craft a special weapon with a very high critical hit chance. Those weapons can be enchanted easily, but since their critical hit chance effect just works on monsters which are the same level as the weapons level, they will be kinda up outdated fast and you will notice that dungeon weapons are still a lot stronger if you want to invest the money. If you're just going for leveling up that's a nice boost while you're doing that. If you reach certain levels you can go to your trainer and learn new skills. There are glyphs for each skill various glyphs so they're always a little bit different and they are also available in a different amount for each skill. You will then use those glyphs to enhance and kind of vary around with your different skills. Give them for example a longer stun duration, more damage, a shorter cooldown and similar. Later in the game you can then get advanced glyphs which then will reduce the costs of the existing glyphs or make them stronger. Enchanting is also kind of important. You can enchant items from plus 1 to plus 9 by using alkahests and sacrificing weapons or items of the same tier as the one you want to enchant. Plus 9 is the maximum, then you need to master work it with common enigmatic or master enigmatic scrolls. When they are master work, they are stronger and you can then enchant them from plus 10 to plus 12 to make them even more powerful. From plus 7 to plus 12 they will also gain, or at least weapons, will gain a visual effect, a glowing effect, going from a light blue up to a red. The combat system in Terra does root you, which means that during most attacks you actually can't move around. That is different in most MMOs and people are not used to it. They are getting very frustrated by that very early on and drop the game or just hate on the combat system. And yeah, basically it's a love it or hate it. The combat system is kind of the thing that most people are getting afraid of, you could say. In early levels it's very restricting, or it feels very restricting, and it's really hard to get into it. But the higher you, you get with your level, the better glyphs you get, the better equipment you get, and the more you get used to it, the more you realize that you can do a lot of things with this kind of combat system. It can be really hard to master, but it is a lot of fun if you manage it. The basic thought in Terra's combat system is that you move around through your skills. So you are not walking and pushing buttons to cast actually attacks, but you perform your attacks and you move with them. For example, as a warrior I can use Rising Furry to get closer to my enemy, Pounce to actually close the gap, follow up with Reverse Cut and use Blade Draw before I use my Death from Above and dodge after that to the side. While this is how it works for the melee classes, how you get into the range of your enemies and follow up things, it is a little bit different for ranged combat. Those are more reliant on CC or dodging and evading than actually moving through their own skills. Though some of them have also skills which are moving them away. 
While the combat system in PvP in Terra is kinda unbalanced, I think it is really thought through for the actual gameplay itself and is a lot of fun. On the other side, you have to be a fan of it. If you really hate the routing yourself, you can't handle it, can't manage it, or you just don't want to, you won't have fun with it. Who would have thought it? The questing in Terra is grindy as hell. You get quests to kill, gather, deliver, escort, activate, and sometimes you fight in a group of NPCs, or there's just one sneaking quest in the whole game which is kind of funny, and one quest where you can mount a cannon and kill some huge monsters. And also of course, the BAM fights, the big ass monsters that are running around in Terra and are like bosses which are just walking around in the world and you can randomly fight them, or for a quest. Unfortunately this will carry on to the later endgame quests for alliances or your daily quests it will be pretty much the same. But there are some funny things in it. Luckily there are a lot of references to movies and other games and it's really cool translated to make it very funny. For example there's a quest called Bring Me a Shrubbery and this kind of stuff manages to bring a smile on your face while <laughs> yeah you know you're grinding your way up to 60. There are people who actually like this kind of gameplay, but if you really don't like it, then try to play the game with friends, because it will be much more fun, and you can take on big monsters, which you thought you can't handle before. After the questing, which is so simple, let's take a look at the lore, because the lore in Terra is actually very rich and interesting. There's a big amount of races, creatures, towns and locations, and they are connected in a huge world with a great background story. It is really very interesting, but sadly it is so bad delivered, because to actually get your information you would have to read all of the quest text, get your information online, read develop developer interviews. So let me just read the start of the Terra wiki to get you into the grasp of this. So I want to suggest that you at least read the story quest texts and also watch the cutscenes, which there are a couple of. Like a couple, I don't know, 20, 25 throughout the game, something like that. That's actually kind of interesting to watch and they're never really too long. So back to that basic lore piece that I want you to hear from the Terra wiki. How Terra began. The world of Terra began millennia ago when two titans of unimaginable power, Arun and Shara, met in a formless void. For reasons we can only guess, they fell asleep, and as they slept, Terra took shape around them. If you look at the map of the world today, you can see Arun and Shara. Their sleeping bodies became the two continents that bear their names. Centuries passed, and deserts, mountains, rivers and forests grew upon Arun and Shara yet still they slept. Even for an omnipotent titan, every sleep is a chance to dream. As Arun and Shara slept, their dreams came to life, life in the literal sense. Arun's and Shara's dreams coalesced into the first living beings to call Terra home. These first creatures, twelve in all, had godlike power, yet it wasn't long before schemes and rivalries emerged and the gods were at each other's throats. So surely I misread a couple words, but I think it's kind of cool and those gods and other things are creating different races that you know from Terra. Also there are races which kind of didn't make it and actually died before they had a chance to actually had a huge impact on the current Terra that we know, the story that we know from the game. And though they have a lot of rivalries and so on, I mean the races themselves, for example, to the Castanic, they are like, wow, they get beaten up so badly by everyone, though they didn't do anything wrong. That's kinda a ton of misunderstandings and nobody ever, nobody actually knows it. That's kind of funny. And at the end, the Argon emerge and they try to destroy Arun and uh, Shara. And um, those are the guys that you are actually fighting in the game. 
Sounds and music have a top quality. There are a lot of tracks for different zones, battlegrounds, and the yeah fighting moments. Kind of. You have uh, also different voices for your player. The NPC voices, which are of course English, can be changed with uh, in official patches to Korean or Japanese if you don't like those. The sounds of monsters, attacks, and the uh, environment are really powerful, and they fit, luckily. And it sounds just really natural. There is actually... I don't remember a moment where I thought, man, that really sounded stupid. The UI of Terra is one of the cleanest I've ever seen. It's very minimalistic and functional and heavily customizable. And because of that, it will need its own video to show you in detail what's possible and why you should change the basic layout of it. But you will also notice that the UI is very performance heavy and it depends on your computer but it can be randomly that you just lose frames because of the UI being open or something like that. It's kind of weird and Terra surely has some performance problems. The controls in Terra are like in an action game. You kind of control your character's view with your mouse and then you use your attacks to kind of hit in that direction. You can toggle your mouse cursor so you can interact with the UI with a key that you can of course customize by yourself. The game is also playable with a key, uh, the key with a gamepad. This um, may be great for the start, and I also read that people sometimes use it in the end game. So it seems that if you do that correctly, you can actually really play with a gamepad in the end game, um, despite of the amount of skills. I haven't really tried that, but if people say it's possible, I guess it is. You probably will want to rebind your keys then eventually, from the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and two other keys like Q, E, R, T, um, V or X, something like that, so that you can interact with your character faster. PvE, or rather the combat system will be, of course, challenging for new players, or at least different, if you don't know this kind of yeah, combat system from other games, or just aren't used to such stuff at all. And as you progress, you will get, of course, more experience in um, just adjusting your playstyle, and you can adjust how you play the game to the current situation while you master your class on your way to level 60. Though I gotta say that if you reach level 60, some things will change and you probably have to redo your whole thinking. There's a good amount of different monsters and BAMs, I think there are 30 to 40 different BAMs. BAMs are big as monsters, really big monsters, which are bosses running around in the world which you can fight. They're pretty strong, you can solo them with almost, with actually every class you can solo BAMs, but you gotta be experienced for that. Otherwise, you want to have a group to kill those. They have of course different attacks, but they will be reused for quite some time. Like, they will be reused often, because there are a lot of different monsters in those zones, which are pretty big, and you will see the same kind of monster with a different attack pattern, with a different attack, or a different color, and this will also happen throughout the dungeons, which is kind of sad. But thinking of that, there will be a dungeon patch soon, which will at least introduce new kind of um, yeah, endgame BAMs and stuff like that. At level 60 you will have about 15 dungeons, not counted the hard modes. Unfortunately, some of those dungeons are just worth playing once or twice because you want to just see them, but they don't benefit you greatly, because they're, they're just outdated. And while you are leveling, you get around every... at level 20 you get your first dungeon. A couple levels after that you get the next dungeon. So actually, like every 5 to 10 levels you get one or two dungeons and it varies. So sometimes you get more, sometimes you get less. Some of the dungeons have been moved to the end game, which actually have been some kind of the mid-end game of the leveling process. Also, this is kind of weird. But the most dungeons are kind of easy if you know what you're doing. Of course, if you don't know anything, then it might be that you think, Wow, shit, 
I don't know what the fuck is going on. At the end game, there are a couple of harder dungeons like Manaya's Core, and if you're a new player, you will surely find other dungeons difficult as well, like Wonder Home, though they actually have a much lower difficulty rate and they are much more forgiving than, for example, Manaya's Core, which is like five players, one guy does something stupid, and you completely wipe. <clears throat> then there's the Nexus which is uh, timed for yeah different days in, in a week and, and there will be portals that open in different areas and monsters spawn you gotta take quests and kill those monsters until you close each of the nexus which is an argon invasion and uh, then you will teleport to, uh, to a mini dungeon with a couple of rooms um, where we get some good loot there may be things I haven't told you but just Keep in mind that I want to give you a basic overview as fast as possible of the whole game. PvP is a little messed up right now, especially because um, somehow the rewards for Battlegrounds are just so weird that people stop playing one Battleground for this patch, then they stop that Battleground for that patch and play rather that one just because of the rewards. That's really weird. So you get Freywind at level 60 which is a 15 versus 15 dungeon with a pretty long queue time right now. So long that in the forums people have actually started to say okay guys, let's queue all up at this time so we can play some matches of Freywin. Um, I know this happened in North America and it happens right now also in Europe. Then there's Corsa Stronghold which you can visit at level 30 you will get gear that is as strong as everybody's because it will be equalized. It's a battle crown that is 20 versus 20 where you gotta storm a castle, destroy a crystal and in the next round the other team has to do the same. While in Freywind you basically just have to get the points of the other or you have to get the most points in a certain time. So um, the, the queue of course a stronghold is rather fast because between level 30 and 60, that's a huge range, so a lot of people can queue up there. Then there's the arena, which is Skyring. This is a 3 vs 3, where you can solo queue or queue with a team. And this is just for level 60. The queue time there is also rather long if you don't queue during the times where the most people queue. And uh, let's put it like that, people try to abuse Skyring a lot. So. Then there is right now Kuma Asylum, which is apparently an event, but I read that in Korea Season 2 of Kuma Asylum started. So, um, two possibilities, which I'm not sure of right now. They removed it and they brought it back for Season 2, or they kept it in there and started Season 2. In any ways, it's a weird, weird battleground. It's a 10 vs 3, and basically 10 players out of Federation and they have equalized gear they start at a beach and they have to storm a little kind of yeah a childish world with cubes and stuff like that of kumas and those three kumas are the other players um, which are bosses then do two different boss kinds a normal kuma, kuma and a boss kuma and uh, those are actually fighting against each other so you get the possibility to actually fight as a boss, um, which is of course kinda cool. The Federation players have to steal three or two to three um, of the enemy diamonds to win that round. And it's also goodly visited since it's level 30 plus. Some classes are just stronger in PvP than others. This is just how it is. Um, Blue Hole Studio, the developer, tries to balance it a bit, but it doesn't... yeah, it gets better but uh, of course people have different opinions and your favorite class you will never want to have a nerf for it um, even if you fight versus that class in a battleground and you say fuck why is this shit so overpowered it will always be like that and that's just how it is the class versus class system in one versus one is a little bit like rock paper scissor um, sometimes it will also just be that you beat each other after another. It's kind of, it's um, you gotta experience it for yourself. 
I could say. But there are also people who just master their class and wreck everything. I met a Sork, which, uh, where we had like a tournament in our old guild, he just blew up everybody. Like, Sork is told to be... People say it's a predictable class. Especially in 1 vs 1, because they have a stun, which is very predictable. It's, uh, yeah, it's just how it is. And this guy, just he didn't need that. He just, yeah, he just wrecked everybody. It was incredible um, in seconds. Like, nobody stood a chance. And it's not like he had uber gear or something, because we all played in, like, very old, outdated um, a PvP gear that uh, was, like... <laughs> The, the state of the day a year ago or so, really old stuff, and that was incredible. So if you can master your class, then you have good chances of being just a train wreck. So what you gotta take care of in a PvP server is also that there is outlaw, outlaw declaration, which basically means you can attack everybody and everybody can attack you. So what board level 60 players do they basically go into the lower level towns and just kill everybody and they don't care. They get infamy which lets them not turn off their their uh, their outlaw declaration so everybody can actually attack them outside of towns. But it's really no punishment at all and they're just grinding their way through level yeah, true tr lobbies. So what you want to do is maybe change the channel. In the starter zones there are luckily 1 to 10 channels so you can switch around and just get away from those people. There are also guild wars but you have to kind of organize themselves so if you declare guild wars it, um, it's 24 hours and in that time you can basically attack everybody um, outside of a town which is from, uh, from the uh, guild you declared war to so basically like outlaw declaration just restricted to that guild. If you kill one guy, you get one point. If you kill the leader, you get ten points. Um, so the best thing, if you want to have a proper fight, is to actually say, "Hey, come on, uh, we do guild war," or you just declare it and say, oh, "Let's meet here and there," and then you just fight like organized. Another part of PvP is alliance fights, but this is also part of the political system and uh, newly introduced alliances. So if you read on a web page like TerraEurope.com, a uh, super awesome political system, then you know that those guys don't know shit about their own game because that political system has been removed for quite some time already. So that means that this feature is advertised, but it's not in the game for months. I mean, like, I don't know what they're thinking. Gameforge themselves aren't thinking anyways. So anyways, you don't have the political system anymore, which was electing monarchs throughout continents and you give them and their guilds property and benefits. So now we have the alliance system. Basically there are three alliances. The Free Traders Collective, the Enlightened Union and the Iron Order. Your guild master will be able to choose, in general just guild masters, which alliance they want to join. This will give them a little bony to various things. For example, the Free Traders Collective, they get a little gold bonus if they kill monsters. The Enlightened Union, they will gain more reputation credits from doing quests. And the Iron Order, they get a little PvP boost regarding resistances. Each alliance is assigned to one big city, Kayator, Elementiar or Velika. Well, the fitting one, since each of those alliances are representing one of those cities. And what you can do is actually go to the alliance building, which is close to the big city. And there you will have special traders and uh, stuff like that, and you can get um, the quests there. Interestingly, in the alliance you have to do a lot of PvE um, to enjoy the best part of the PvP. That's kind of a weird system, which probably is supposed to keep players in the game, if you know what I mean there. You can use a teleporter in each alliance building to get to the alliance zone, which is basically an instance zone or a couple of instance zones. 
each alliance has one of those zones where your base is and there are outposts of the two other alliances. Then you can do your daily quest there to rank up or just kill stuff to get some temporary bonuses which you can use in PvP. There are PvE and PvP times which means just in PvP times you can actually attack enemies so to say actually just different alliances. This actually leads to some nice PvP fun. I mean some people may appreciate it but there is some stuff that I'm not so happy about. For example by gathering you gain a movement speed bonus which stacks up to 30 stacks and I think it's like 0.5 movement speed per stack something like that. I'm not sure about the uh, com yeah the the values. Um, if you kill certain monsters or mobs, you gain um, yeah PvP defense or d PvP attack. And um, if you farmed a lot of stuff before the PvP time, then you are certainly a lot stronger than if an alliance, an enemy alliance, has not done that. In the past, you were able to attack um, at most PvP times the enemy executor, which means you basically rush the base and you kill the guards, you kill all the players, it stood in your way and you kill the executor and it led to some really strategic moments and very cool, yeah, very cool experiences I had in the past with the alliance system. Um, very interesting. By now, I gotta admit that I haven't played alliance for quite some time. I know there is a new system in place which replaces the old one, which means that you can actually kill the executor, um, yeah, like three times a day or something like that, but just once a week. Which means that every Sunday, in Europe at least, every Sunday there are a couple of hours reserved for a couple of high rank members, like, I don't know, a couple hundred of the highest ranked members of the Alliance. And what you gotta do is you have, um, in each Alliance zone you have crystals. And you gotta destroy those crystals to destroy the shield of the enemy base. So you have to split up your forces to defend your own zone and to attack an enemy zone. When all those crystals are destroyed, you are able to attack the enemy executor and kill him. So in those couple of hours, there's like a... A really big battle going on with a couple hundred players which are trying to protect their own property while killing the enemy executor which can of course be a lot of fun and while it's now limited to once per week to kill the executor you still can do pvp in pvp times just normally but i mean people are still attacking the base and stuff and killing everybody there since you can kind of distract guards and stuff like that but you're not able to kill the executor anymore this is on the one side i think it's a little bit sad but on the other one this happened so often, players were so engaged in the first weeks into that, that it really, it costs players a lot of time and they lost the fun of it and eventually they stopped doing it. Cause it just happened every couple hours. It was just too much. People burned out on it. So it's quite good that it is limited now to once per week and you still can do your skirmishes whenever you want in PvP times. There are also some other things like you can get a horse or a mask if you're a higher ranked member. Um, you can actually do vaults which gives you some loot with one or five men. There's a new item called Noctanium Infusions which boosts your skills if you use it but for each skill it will use one infusion. Um, so there are a couple things in the alliance system which are kind of interesting as well and it's a place where a lot of play players are hanging out right now besides of the normal cities. As a lower level player you can visit the alliances but starting with level 60 you are just able to do stuff there because you're too weak too low level before that so it's not adjusted for low level players. But I'll cover alliance in another video as well. Let's talk a moment about patches. So, patches are quite regular in the last months. 
NA, North America and Europe are getting actually the same patches at pretty much the same time. Europe has the problem that it has to translate those patches into different languages and not just English. So it will always take a little bit longer there. You can assume that every two weeks you get a shop update, which means a new weapon skin for everybody or a new costume or some other interesting items, interesting <laughs> items, or a mount or something like that. And about every one to two months there is a patch, which may be bigger or maybe smaller. For example, we just got a hotfix, which didn't do much, but uh, I assume that we're getting another patch in quite some time. The Reaper is out in Keitara and they're approaching the new dungeons, which means that we finally get some really hard dungeons again and I'm actually pretty excited for that. Gotta farm some gold for it. Cash up and subscription. So the cash up is actually quite nice because beside of the price it's uh, everything it's a is a little bit pricey in NA and in Europe but uh, beside of that um, there is no pay to win. Of course you can since you can trade all those items or almost all those items you can actually buy things in the cash shop and sell them for gold in the game. Also, the, what differentiates oh God, that word NA from EU is that in NA you can buy spell binds and stuff like that in the shop by buying boxes which randomly drop an amount of that. So you're kind. This, this is a little bit more pay to win, I guess, but it doesn't really matter that much in my opinion. It's not like a huge, it's not any benefit that you couldn't get into in the game. And then there's, then there's of course the subscription of, I, I uh, oh, speaking, uh, it's getting a little bit uh, out of hand now. <laughs> I spoke too much today. So, um, subscription. There is the possibility to pay 13 euros a month. I'm not sure, 15 dollars maybe in NA. And then you get some benefits. You get a mount. You get daily boosters for experience through monsters, gold that you pick up, gold which you get from uh, quests, and reputation which you get from uh, yeah from daily quests, which are kind of important in the early end game. Those things are not important if you're leveling a character. I gotta say because the experience from mobs, for example, if you're just leveling normally without doing power leveling, it is not worth it at all to just get it for that. You can get a travel atlas by the subscription which is permanent and it will actually like for 30 days and it will let you travel to each location which is really really nice and you have your cooldowns halved on dungeons or you get a double entry to the, uh, the Terra Club or the Elite subscription in NA. Um, it's just a different uh, name to call it. So in my opinion, those bonuses are just good for the early endgame. And then for the endgame, if you're a hardcore player who just farms dungeons like crazy and has nothing else to do. But if you just start the game and you're leveling, then the game will be exactly as if you just purchased it. Because you have no, uh, no downside. The game, when it went free to play, it, it didn't get cut or anything. Just subscription just gave you bonuses. The only downside that you have as a free to play player is that you have just one instead of four bank tabs and that you have uh, just two instead of eight character slots. This is the only downside. Um, what you can do, by the way, is if you reach the city, you just go to um, the guild master guy and you create a guild which doesn't cost much and then you get like four bank tabs for free. So we have five. Actually, I forgot the character creation, so I'm gonna do that now real fast. Of course, you can choose every race as female and male form. Beside of the Baraka, there are just Barakas, Neutrum or something like that. The Ellen are actually the female version of the Popori. Uh, it's, it got a little bit confused in the past studio like uh, blue hole studios wasn't really sure if they implement these or that and yeah whatever in the end you have those races separated 
Anyways, uh, you can, of course, uh, the class, by the way, doesn't um, affect your appearance at all. And you can choose between different presets. You can also randomize your character, but it uh, does look rather horrifying in most cases. Your chance to get a good face is probably 1 in 100 or something like that. But apparently this randomizer just randomizes everything and has no restrictions. Um, so with that I mean that, for example, no, you, you don't randomize that slider on maximum or minimum because it will look awful in any way. Can then choose your hairs, 10 to 15 styles per um, uh, per race, I'd say, male, female, plus minus of course, and uh, your face type. You can choose skin color and hair color, and for the adornments which are like uh, different kind of details and makeup and stuff in your face, uh, you gotta watch out because regarding um, of the face you pick, the adornments can be different. So let's say there's phase 1, 3, 5, 7 and 8 and those share the same adornments but um, other faces may have different kind of adornments, some little additions or yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's like that so that you, I mean, it's weird, it's just weird but you gotta try it out um, if you wanna just see everything. <clears throat> So, um, you then have to find details, uh, we have your eyes, nose, mouth and ears. You can change pretty much everything, it's actually a pretty powerful character editor. And uh, some of the sliders don't have too many different uh, steps. But I, I think it's regardless uh, really powerful. You can make a really good looking character and have a lot of um, differences between yours. Or you can just make them flat out, yeah. You know, look at this monster. Oh God, I'm really scared. It's a it's a really fun tool, by the way. So if you just want to have a little bit of fun with it, I'm sure you will try out this kind of stuff. Anyways, I made a mistake earlier where I said there are six voices, but there are actually just five. So you can of course check different outfits that you will or will not encounter in the game. Um, you probably won't have Abyss gear, which is uh, here almost the last one and here we have the different voices sadly in all those times or in all the time uh, they didn't patch anything new into the editor that's a bit sad but it's it's still a good character editor the video is really long now but a little wrap up for the end game so what you do in pve is basically the latest release dungeons you will have to farm them to get the best jewelry and they will also drop items for pretty good gear, like actually better gear than before that patch. It's really easy to get. So then you have to farm Temple of Temerity and Crucible of Flame for tokens to exchange for Badic Lifts, um, which will of course enhance your skills even more. Those tokens can also be bought if you have the gold for it. You can do the Nexus for money and for some endgame items. You can farm a Labyrinth of Terror, Aventar or Calcyx's Nest. Calcyx's Nest, I think, actually, it's saying. Um, for items that you need to enchant your gear and masterwork it. Um, so, this is basically the PvE endgame. Of course, you will also find some other things to do. PvP, of course, do the battlegrounds, get credits and buy um, with that your better PvP gear, then you will get stronger for the Alliance PvP for Guild Wars or Nexus Wars. Guild Wars I explained earlier, Nexus Wars are pretty much the same, but they occur during the Nexus and it's also called Ninja Guild Wars or... What was the name? I don't remember. Anyways, it's basically different guilds are staying around in the Nexus waiting for it to open or something to happen and then they declare really fast a guild war on another guild and try to like wreck them um, while they're at a disadvantage. It's, um, it's something you have to look out for and you just have to keep in mind it's, it's possible with game mechanics and even if it's a dick move you shouldn't look at it like that. You can also at a final solution farm achievements to get some nice items or just because you want to have those points and solo dungeons or beat dungeons with weird class combinations and out of the ordinary stuff 
so that you can say, hey, damn, I did that. Maybe I'm better than I thought I am at my class. So here we have it, a 45 minute video about if Terra is still worth it. With all the details you gotta know, I'm not sure but I think I covered everything um, that you have to know before actually getting into the game clueless and dropping it after some hours. I guess it's better to just invest um, this 45 minutes while you play another game and just listen to this before actually wasting your time on a download. <laughs> well, how big is the game? About 20 to 30 gigabyte. That may be not a problem for one guy, but for the other it is. So hope you enjoyed this video. Um, if you liked it, please give it a like, subscribe to the channel. There will be a lot more videos about Terra very soon. And I hope that you guys have a nice day. See you soon.